Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kudin. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Anthony Albanese has been sworn in as Australia's 31st Prime Minister after his Labour Party defeated Scott Morrison's Liberal National Coalition in the country's federal elections last weekend. The new PM has vowed to take Australia in a new direction with a big shift in climate policy. Joining us now to discuss this further, we have Kian Wong. He's a Malaysian journalist and editor based in Sydney. He was also a former parliament correspondent for several Australian newspapers. Kian, let's, uh, we, as we understand it, the vote counting is still going on, um, that not all the seats have been called because I think the uh, postal votes are still being counted. But what do we know of how the current results uh, will shape federal government formation? Well, he's going to, uh, the new Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, uh, in whose electorate I live in, actually, in the inner city of Sydney, in a city suburb of Sydney. Um, he is on track really to win at least 74, if not the bare minimum 76 seats he needs for a bare majority in the House of Representatives in the federal parliament. Uh, the picture for the Senate is a bit more mixed, um, but overall it's a fairly good result for what is only the fourth time um, since the Second World War for the Labour Party to win government. So it's quite historic in many ways and uh, has several parallels actually to what happened in Malaysia in 2018. Yeah, Kian, could you help us understand why Scott Morrison's coalition failed? It had been powerful close to a decade um, it, you know, the, the, uh, Scott Morrison being a Pentecostal and, and having specific ideas. I think he was associated with a kind of climate denialism. Could you help us understand Scott Morrison's government and what was it about it that turned voters off this time? Well, I think that truism about how uh, governments lose power or lose elections rather than oppositions winning elections is quite true here. I think a lot of people basically intensely disliked the Prime Minister for the failures of his leadership for not doing very much and going allegedly missing in action in many instances from the uh, massive bushfires to the great flooding incidences uh, to basically fudging the need for Australia to meet you know, it's net zero commitments at Glasgow in the climate talks. So, and he has been uh, in some ways part of the leadership that has uh, been part of this nearly decade old uh, conservative government uh, in climate denialism. So you could say the Australian public or voters probably will actually have felt enough is enough. They. Uh, very much have voted in across the board, um, not just Labour, but also a substantial um, third force, if you like, of uh, Greens Party um, members, both in the lower house and in the Senate, as well as a whole raft of independents um, in what were blue ribbon conservative seats, uh, wealthy seats of uh, the major cities, um, where uh, the top priority for these independents was uh, climate action. So you could say it was climate action, um, the inability of Morrison's government to deal with the many grievances uh, that have arisen from many reports over uh, the treatment of women in workplaces and in parliament, and also scandals involving uh, the aged care system and, you know, um, the problem of the economy, inflation. Right. That, 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 there's a lot to, to deal with. Can I just ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the climate policy? What is it that's been promised? Uh, what is this big shift that we're going to be seeing, hopefully, um, in terms of climate policy for Australia? Well, the Labour Party um, policy going in has been accused of being a bit uh, lacking in ambition 
in trying to meet Australia's net zero commitments uh, for, for the Glasgow Summit by 2050. But uh, it is ambitious enough that it is a bit more than um, the coalition of what Morrison took to the elections. Okay, okay. We're running out of time. I just want to ask you about COVID and did, did the handling of COVID have an impact on this election? It did to the extent that many of the urban seats in which uh, the Morrison government lost uh, power in, um, some of them uh, were very badly affected by very harsh lockdowns. And also the federal government's uh, um, laggardness of what they called a stroll out as opposed to a rollout of ordering enough vaccines and getting enough Australians vaccinated in a timely manner. The government was, um, again, a bit lackadaisical. And it, it, it's been a charge that has been leveled at the Morrison government over a whole raft of issues, too little, too late, whether it's been the climate issue or dealing with the pandemic or the vaccine rollout. Okay, and what do you expect to see from say the first hundred days i mean he's coming in with on the back of huge expectations he's coming in on the back of what many have called a historic shift so what is it do you think he'll be able to meet those expectations what is the australian public looking for in that first hundred days i think right now it has to do with making more substantial commitments and pushing through legislation on climate action uh, it also has a lot to do with, I think, the undercurrent right now, which is very substantive as well, uh, about issues of inflation and the cost of living, the soaring price of living, and the fact that um, average wages have been stagnant for some time. And actually, the trap that many Western economies, including Australia, are falling into the dreaded stagflation of the 1970s, where inflation rises, but uh, the cost of living rises, but um, wages and um, can't keep up with that and growth, you know, stalls. So it's, it's a pretty difficult time to come in uh, to government um, worldwide as well as domestically. But Australia uh, has recently posted record low unemployment rate um, and the economy has been humming along okay thanks to uh, record commodity prices. So yeah. the, it's it's a bit of a juggling act, but Australia also is facing, you know, a mounting uh, interest rate uh, bill uh, because of its massive nearly trillion dollar deficit. All right. Ken, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Ken Wong, journalist and editor. We're going to take a quick break here and consider this. We will be back with more. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. With me is Sharad Kutta. And let's continue our discussion about the outcome of last weekend's elections in Australia. Joining us now is Mark Kenny. He's a professor at Australian National University in Canberra. He's also a columnist and political analyst for the Canberra Times. Mark, um, talk to us about the outcome of the election. Did that come as a surprise to many? Or was the writing on the wall for the Liberal National Coalition government? Uh, well, I think, uh, amazingly, Melissa, the answer is yes to both. I mean, it did, in a way, come out of the blue, um, but uh, at another level, of course, uh, the polls were showing that the government was in the government of Scott Morrison, the nine-year-old government of the coalition, was in some degree of trouble. Now, I suppose what made people nervous about making predictions about it was that there were a number of variables in play, uh, and the polls in the 2019 election, the last election before this one, uh, had predicted that the government was in deep trouble then as well, but the government had survived under Scott Morrison's leadership. So there was a degree of kind of nervousness, I think, in the commentariat uh, about predicting the outcome. 
even though opinion polls, the pollsters had made changes to the way they did it. They'd sort of made their surveying techniques more robust and representative. They thought they'd made the, the necessary changes, but there was still a, a degree of reluctance uh, on the part of, uh, I think, the political parties themselves, uh, but also commentators, political experts, uh, were just sort of waiting for what the voters decided. And then when they did see what the voters decided, it was a very unorthodox count indeed. Okay, let's talk about the count. So the power of prayer perhaps did not work for Scott Morrison this time. Uh, what about uh, the the kind of the difference between the lib, uh, sorry the the successes that Labour had versus uh, the independents that were called, called the teal independents, the colour code they were given, uh, as well as the Greens. Yeah, well, that was the uh, most interesting thing about this election, apart from the fact that it is a change of government election. Now, in Australia, that doesn't happen as often as, as, as even many Australians think. It's only the fourth time now that Labor has gone from being in opposition to being in government. Uh, it had only done it three times since the Second World War uh, and only the fourth time now. So that, that was a big story in itself. But the other big story running, of course, as you referred to in your question, was about all of these independents running in a whole run range of constituencies, um, mostly safe conservative constituencies. That's the important thing here. So Labor wasn't actually running against independents for the most part, although it did lose a seat to an independent. Um, but the but the independents that were running, there were almost all of them were women, and they were highly uh, you know qualified professional women who were running against sitting Liberals, in some cases very senior sitting Liberal members of Parliament, ministers, uh, in seats that have been in the hands of that particular political party, the Liberal Party, uh, since the beginning, since the beginning of Federation virtually. So um, it was a really strange circumstance that the government found itself in. It was fighting to hold government against Labor. It was fighting to hold its own what used to be safest seats against this kind of rebellion uh, from within. Uh, and that rebellion from within obviously has gutted now the Liberal Party. Can I ask you about a comment that you, so you wrote in a political analysis, you said Scott Morrison's approach can be described as divide and dither. And now that was very curious to me because I was wondering what you meant by that. And I'm, I'm wondering whether that is a reflection of why the campaign didn't succeed. I think it is a reflection of why the government eventually fell over. It, it, it ultimately hadn't given voters enough to cling on to in terms of substance. I mean, if you look at the legacy of uh, Scott Morrison's government, it's pretty thin. And if you take out the, um, the pandemic, which arrived not long after Scott Morrison won his first election in 2019, he'd, of course, been elevated to the prime ministership by an internal party realignment, by a, by a, a leadership change inside the Liberal Party. But he fought, it, fought that 2019 election and won it. And he won it really on a promise of not being Labor. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, if it hadn't been for the pandemic coming along, uh, one wonders what they would have been doing for the last three years because the pandemic at least gave them some things to do. But uh, really, um, when even in the pandemic, you know, the acquisition of vaccines, the acquisition of rapid antigen tests, <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm struggling with a, a bit of a cold here. Um, these things, uh, you know, caused a lot of dissatisfaction in the electorate, how, how slow the government was to act. They played into a complaint about the government in terms of being very slow and reluctant to do anything about climate change. We had bushfires and massive floods more recently. The government had developed a reputation for essentially not moving quickly when it needed to and for being caught up in ideological fights that it had largely, largely manufactured itself culture wars over things like same-sex marriage and these sorts of things, you know, creating divisions within the community for political purposes rather than um, getting on with uh, pushing forward with big reforms. So, Mark, can we talk about the numbers? Because uh, I know the uh, Labour hasn't, at least at the point of this recording, uh, <coughs> achieved uh, an, an absolute majority. So th there's a possibility of a minority government, but... All <coughs> <coughs> majority government, that it will be um, uh, one with a slim majority, one that will have to reach across the aisle to the independents as well as to Greens. What do you think uh, this, uh, how does this, uh, will, will this play out in the near future? Are we looking at instability or a, of a different type of stability that comes from bipartisanship? 
Yeah, the question of stability is going to be an interesting one. At the moment, the Australian Electoral Commission is projecting that Labor will end up getting 76 seats, uh, possibly even 77. Now, 76 is the minimum number you need for governing in your own right. So there may not even be a need for Anthony Albanese's Labor, Anthony Albanese's Labor government to reach an agreement with other members of parliament to provide it with that majority. Uh, that said, Albanese has made it quite clear on his first day that he intends on leading a more collaborative style of parliament. He wants to consult with the crossbench, with, with others. He wants to have a, a less combative sort of politics. So, I, and, and he does have some experience of doing this. He was manager of uh, government business when Julia Gillard was prime minister back between 20, 2010 and 2013. And back then, Labor did not have a majority. So Albanese was the one who did all of the negotiations with the crossbench back then. Right. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. We appreciate your time. Mark Kenny, Professor at Australian National University in Canberra. We're going to take another quick break here and consider this. We will be back with more. Thanks so much for staying with Shrad and I on Consider This. Joining us now is Dr. Sukmani Korana. She's a Senior Research Fellow at Western Sydney University. Uh, Dr. Sukmani, can, can we talk a little bit about the what happens now following... We understand that counting is still uh, underway, but following the elections, is the Australian Parliament going to be more multicultural, more representative of, the, um, of Australians? Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's it's really been an unprecedented um, outcome, and it's being touted as one of the most transformative elections in recent Australian political history. Um, and one of the reasons is obviously because you know we've got a number of women um, from seats that were usually held by the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party is the one which was formerly in government with another party called the Nationals. Um, and so a number of the former safe liberal seats are now have now been won by uh, five independent women, uh, which is really, you know, you can't even begin to imagine what that looks like in, in a country where usually the incumbent wins the seat, especially if it's a safe seat. And this is just talking about, you know, women uh, from Anglo or European backgrounds. But then if you start looking at some of the seats the Labour Party has won, um, and I'll get to the others in a bit. The Labour Party has uh, one has won seats where they were fielding candidates who were uh, women of colour, which is also quite new in the Australian landscape. We had, did have a few women in the Senate, notably uh, Penny Wong, who's of Malaysian Chinese descent. She's been in the Senate for a while and she will most likely be our new foreign minister. But this is the first time that they had uh, candidates like Sally Situ, who's of uh, Lao Chinese descent, and she won an inner city Sydney seat. Uh, a candidate like uh, uh, someone who's a medical doctor, Dr. Michelle Anand Raja, in a seat in Melbourne, um, and as well as you know a fairly significant contingent of Indigenous women. I think six or seven that have won seats across Australia. So, so I, mean, I don't yeah, think we've yeah, seen so an election sorry. like this in a long time. Right. So if I could just jump in, since you mentioned Indigenous uh, uh, candidates who've won, uh, mm -hmm. Albanese, who's now you, the new prime minister, mentioned the Uluru Statement. And if you can help yep. us understand the significance of that, considering that Indigenous people in Australia are a tiny minority, must make no significant electoral impact. Uh, that's that's a great question. Um, so it's not a it's not something which has an electoral impact in in the sense of like the sheer numbers of people that are affected by it. But I think in a symbolic sense, it makes a significant impact because uh, those are what we call our First Nations people and comparable countries which have got Indigenous people 
um, like New Zealand, like Canada, especially already have treaties with their indigenous people. We're not saying that those nations are perfect, that they're treating their indigenous people really well, but Australia is considerably far behind. Um, and many indigenous groups have come together and you know, formed this cons consensus, which is now the Uluru Statement from the Heart. So um, there is a great deal of political goodwill in trying to implement that in our constitution. I think uh, most indigenous people are quite relieved that it will be going ahead as well as their allies. And I think it bodes well for the racial minorities as well, because it's only when you recognize that we are on indigenous land that we can start talking about equity for the rest of the population. Do, could we come back to the um, representation, uh, having more uh, female representation. There's been a lot of discussion about how the election result was actually driven by women, uh, female voters. And I'm, I'm just wondering how um, accurate was the perception that the coalition was not supportive of women? Was that an accurate um, perception? And how exactly did that translate into a swing with the women's vote? Okay, so uh, what is being called professional women um, is one of the one of the largest demographics, one of the largest growing demographics across Australia. I mean, Australia mostly consists of the capital cities. We also have a significant regional population, but the population of the cities is higher, and the population of professional women is really growing significantly in these cities. And most of these women are um, not happy about. Uh, you know, the way the coalition treated a number of issues, which was specifically to do with women. I mean, women were involved in a lot of care work, both inside and outside the home during the pandemic. Uh, Childcare costs have soared, uh, but also anything to do with, say, there was a big review here called the Jenkins Review, which looked at, you know, the sexual assault and, and related treatment of women in parliament. Um, and there is no will as such to really kind of implement the recommendations of the review the Liberal, uh, the coalition government mostly dismissed any any sort of instances of their uh, political staffers or even their ministers uh, being associated with allegations of this kind. So I think overall it created a picture uh, in the um, you know the professional woman's mind or the average female voter's mind, especially younger women, that this government doesn't take women's issues seriously. And you can definitely see the you know the outcome of that at the ballot box. So many, there was also some controversy over the courting of the Hindu vote. I know a lot of Asian-born Australians, mm -hmm. or maybe of uh, uh, Hindu uh, faith, uh, uh, around uh, the fact that you know uh, saffron sashes are worn uh, at mm -hmm. an organisation that's linked to extremist organisations or chauvinistic uh, uh, Hindu organisations in India. Did it? Was it a? Um, a window on how multiculturalism is being negotiated in a place like Australia, that you have mm -hmm. this kind of courting of a Hindu vote and then the controversy around it? Yeah, I think it speaks to uh, both an opportunity and a problem. So the Indian Australian vote sometimes conflated with the Hindu vote, but you know, Indian Australians uh, obviously, obviously comprise more religions than just Hinduism. Uh, were beginning to be courted this election more than any other election, because again, their numbers are growing. Um, they're getting a little bit more influential, uh, but also a number of them uh, don't necessarily vote for one or the other party, the same party every election. So they can consider new voters or undecided voters. Um, and so both political, both major political parties were making a lot of effort going uh, to Gurdwaras, the Sikh temples, as well as Hindu temples. Um, but it was a little bit controversial, as you may, as you just noted, Shara, because um, uh, there's certain kinds of organizations which are associated, which have links with uh, military organizations or the right wing religious organizations in India, th that which is not to say that they engage in the same kinds of activities here, but nonetheless, they have links and um, they often have kind of uh, leaders who may or may not be representative of the community, but who nonetheless uh, are the face of uh, you know the temples or certain kinds of institutions, cultural institutions who teach Hindi curriculum in New South Wales and schools. So they, they, they exert power in those ways and it becomes problematic when um, I guess political leaders go through those channels to code the community instead of you know other possible ways.
All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. That was Dr. Sukmani Karana from Western Sydney University wrapping up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutun signing off. Thank you so much for watching and good night. <laughs>